The International Life Sciences Institute, ILSI, is a nonprofit worldwide organization whose mission is to provide science that improves human health and well being and safeguards the environment. By working with experts from the government, academia, and industry, our international entities address issues related to food and water safety, nutrition and health, risk science and toxicology, and sustainable agriculture and nutrition security. ILSI is a nonprofit charitable organization that works for the health of the public. ILSI has a commitment to achieve and maintain the highest standards of scientific integrity. It's who we are, and it is inherent to our mission. Our principles for scientific integrity mean we are pursuing objectivity, clarity, and reproducibility in order to ensure the utility of our scientific and scholarly activities and assessments. ILSI entities are membership-based organizations that receive funding primarily through membership fees. ILSI leads and publishes research to answer real-world problems. We offer a truly unique approach to conducting scientific research that allows our organization to facilitate conversations among global experts in a neutral setting. This approach achieves balanced and high-quality specific evidence that can be used for public benefit. All ILSI entities follow a strict code of ethics and believe that good science can have a positive impact on public health around the world. We all share these important guiding principles, and the projects within ILSI entities bring diverse science to the table, driven by unique priorities. You can explore those scientific research priorities by visiting www.ilsi.org. ILSI, building global partnerships for a healthier world. Good morning, good afternoon, and a very warm welcome to our participants from Asia and elsewhere in joining this second webinar in the UC Asia series on COVID-19. First of all, for those of you who are not familiar with ILC, we have shared a short video prior to the start of this event with some housekeeping messages for you to take note of. You can visit our website to learn more about the organization and the scientific program of ILC across the world where we bring experts together to share and discuss uh, important subjects like today. ILC is a global federation of uh, entities initiated in 1987, and it has over the 40 years grown to a network of 15 entities across the world, six of which are in Asia, comprising of UC Japan, Korea, Taiwan, India, a focal point in China, and Southeast Asia region, which covers the grouping of ASEAN and Australasia. We conducted scientific program um, across the world. And for example, in 2019, we hosted about 150 scientific meeting, workshop, some shared as educational videos posted through our website with over 70 scientific publication and research. These are all efforts made through our global tripartite collaboration. And in Asia, just to list a few of the examples of what we have done over the 2019 period, as a collective group, we have hosted 64 seminars, workshop, and sponsor session, published 29 scientific uh, publication, uh, conducted 23 research projects, and collaborated with 72 collaborating institutions and agency across 16 countries and region. So how do we assess our um, achievement. Well, we we conduct our uh, effort through the collaborative uh, collaboration and engagement with um, stakeholders from academia, government, and um, and scientists from industry to, to advance science and achieve positive real world 
um, impact on areas such as nutrition and health, food safety and risk assessment, sustainable food system and environment to ensure that uh, we bring um, a successful and uh, measurable outcome in areas such as the UN Sustainable Development Goal. And collectively, we are also engaged in collaboration across our region and in area that uh, we have been working together. So this brings me to the, today's webinar and um, on the topics of COVID-19, which is part of the UC Global Initiative. Some of these activities has already been conducted across the world, including two webinars on nutrition and immunities in April and May, and several held in the US, Latin America, and in March. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on our panel of speakers who are well-recognized international and regional experts who have extensive and in-depth knowledge on infectious disease, vaccines development, and nutrition research, respectively. They will address the epidemic outbreak and control in China and Korea, mechanism of infection, clinical research for better understanding of how this virus differs from past strains, as well as global collaboration and steps taken to develop vaccine, and also the measure of impact of nutrition status on virus resistance and immune response. Well, the use of technology such as AI that can be harnessed to address COVID-19 and beyond in the health system will be a topic for discussion. So my first speaker is Professor Wu, who is the Deputy Dean of the Shanghai Medical College, Fudan University. And prior to this position, she was the Director General of the Shanghai CDC. She is a lead scientist of the Shanghai COVID-19 Task Force and also a key member of the WHO China Joint Mission on COVID-19. So Professor Wu, the next 20 minutes is yours. Thank okay. you. So, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to introduction about the COVID-19 old response that we take on in China. Uh, so now you can, uh, what we can see it is, to the date of uh, the day before yesterday, there are over uh, uh, seven million, more than seven million cases that are reported to the WHO, and also including more than uh, four uh, four hundred twenty seven uh, thousand deaths cases that are reported to the WHO. So here, this is the old pandemic in the over the world, and we we can do dark color, dark red as the most uh, um, uh, uh, epidemic center right now. And uh, talking about China, in China that we have different kind of uh, dynamic that at the beginning we, we call, we have three different kind of the model of the epidemic. One is the Wuhan model. Wuhan model is, uh, it means uh, they happened earlier when the disease did appear. Um, we don't know what kind of disease it is. And uh, we don't know how they uh, how the virus transmission, and uh, it has already have subsequent com community outbreak. The second model, the second model that we we say it is the out of Hubei in Hubei, but out of Wuhan. That means within that province, which Wuhan is the capital city of that province, they. In the uh, uh, prefecture, immediately uh, at join Wuhan, transmission is less intense, but still they have uh, quite an earlier stage. They have community transmission occurred, um, but later they uh, these area they suddenly to take uh, very quickly intervention to try to stop the transmission. The third model is out of the out of the Hubei province, out of Wuhan, that is the other provinces that are in China. These provinces is already know there is outbreak that happened in Wuhan, and uh, we be very be careful. Uh, look at the individual that from Wuhan, and we call imported cases. They using testing, early testing to try to find out the early case that enter into that province. So these province, we didn't see any, we didn't see a big outbreak in these provinces. Only have an individual or small cluster that happened in these province. So most 
uh, the model, most of these provinces, the, the epidemic, that uh, dynamic in China is these, the third kind of model that happened in China. That means we have few cases in that province and have some cluster happened. So here I showed a different kind of model. So Wuhan model is the first one. The Hubei, outside Wuhan, the Hubei province, the model, and then the, the other, all the other provinces in China, the model. So you will see these kind of uh, dynamic model is totally different. China response. I would like to share with you the old experiences that we have. Uh, I love this, the, the, uh, this picture. Does this picture give us a lot of information? We we stratify these uh, time at a three stage, but now right now I think it is the post epidemic stage. It is the fourth stage. The first stage, it is uh, that means the in this stage we find out the case the early cases and we don't know and we only find out the outbreak in seafood wholesale market. And then we uh, identify the first case and we do the sequencing of the uh, uh, gene. And then we report it to WHO and share all these with the membership of the WHO. Um, and most important is to the date of the uh, January 20, that uh, uh, COVID-19 pneumonia was listed into the raw. That means it, it should be a notifiable diseases according to the raw. And also it listed into the disease raw and health and quarantine raw. That means we need to do quarantine for this uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. I think this is very important because this offers us a, a, a basic raw uh, legislation to support the intervention. And then the second is to the to the twenty uh, third January, and we lock down the Wuhan city. It's a city. It's over uh, a ten thousand. Uh, it's over uh, over over ten million population. So this is is very important issue because we stop the, the transmission from Wuhan out to the to the other. Uh, uh, the rest of the country. Um, the third, the third, so the second period is the mainly outbreak period, and we see the C, the peak at the end, uh, uh, the end, of the day of the January, uh, end of the January, and then gradually down. Once we taken the block, uh, lock down the city, and gradually down, uh, uh, we can see the cases is decrease every day, and uh, this is also important it is to, when it is the main issue that we go to the third stage that is we announced the resu resumption of the uh the labor and the and we we start to back home and we start to work open the school at that at these periods and we see it is very important to give a lot of uh, economic and social support to the intervention so to the end of uh, March, uh, China announced that, that we have the stage of the success on China's epidemic control. So this is now, of course, now this period we call the fourth period is supposed to epidemic period. It's mainly the period that we have to import the cases. But we just last, last week, we found the, uh, a small outbreak in certain city in Beijing. Later, we're talking about this. So China response, uh, I think if we're talking, someone asked me about how do you can uh, control all of this demand within uh, 60 days. The main important issue is we quickly ident we quickly organize the national emergency response, um, especially that, that we have the leadership group, the top level leadership group leading by, uh, by the, uh, uh, Xi Jinping and also the Ke Qiang. And we have nine working groups that are also leading by different kinds of ministers to uh, have the multi-sectoral working group working together. So, and also we have, as I mentioned uh, before, we have the law and legislation support. Uh, quickly, within six days, all the different kind of provinces, all the provinces, they set up similar kind of infrastructure to to uh, control 
follow uh, follow the national emergency response group they have sub, uh, these kind of uh, substructure and also not only at the privilege level but also at the lower level even to the township uh, uh, level so we have these kind of uh, uh, the, the the organization structure i think this is very very important that is called we have the unified and ex effective command system that means we within one week we set up a nationwide command system to to anti the epidemic the second issue is important is we law based we have law based scientific driven and targeted control strategy we have different stage we using different uh, different uh, measures and the stra stra strategic measures in different stage in different area because as I mentioned, we in Wuhan, outside of Wuhan, Hubei province, and the, the other, the rest, the provinces, the rest of the country, we have totally different dynamic model. So we using different strategic issues to to deal with that different kind of model. And the, the other one is that we have four early measures: that early detect, detection, reporting, isolation, and treatment. This is also important, especially to the other, uh, the, the the rest of the Hubei uh, outside Hubei province is important because when at the very beginning, all the provinces have the all they have the imported cases. How to try to early detect the the the, the case, identify them, and also do the tracing, the contact tracing, and try to identify the close contact person, the isolation of this person, and do the treatment to the patients. This could be. Uh, stop uh, stop the transmission to the general population. That means we stop the community transmission further in these province. This is very very important. And also we generate. You see, we we uh, do a lot of uh, coordinated the medical resources that we send more than forty four thousand uh, medical staff to Wuhan and help them to to stop to 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 stop the transmission to stop to the epidemic. This is also very important. And we mobilized the general population. You see, when, uh, when my colleague, international colleague, asked me why these Chinese person all oh, they obey the command, the national command. This is important because everyone they have this, uh, uh, they recognize this epidemic, control epidemic is not something uh, of the other ones, all the medical staffs, all the government, but but it's very very important. They say it's my, it's the duty of myself. So they can follow in the the uh, uh, staying at home, the, the command of staying at home and do the, keep the social distancing, wear, wear the facial mask. So all these, I think it is important to stimulate and enabling the general population to take part in the, the uh, intervention. And the other is the international cooperation, of course, is very, very important because we're sharing the information with all of the world and let them know here have the outbreak. This is the virus that we know. And like today, we share all the information with all the colleagues all over the world and help them to recognize to do early uh, uh, intervention, taking early intervention measures. This this slide shows we using we stratified control measures at uh, different uh, area and a different stage. Lower risk, mid, medium risk, and high risk area we try identify and uh, using different uh, strategic measures. Mm, this the, here I listed it's the all the major measures that we take monitoring and reporting time case finding and testing uh, not, uh, epidemiological intervention try to find a close contact and manage all cases and the the close contact person do the social distancing and also also we do a lot of the social mobilization to help the, the uh, engagement of the community and also emergency material supporting this is not only the material supporting this, including the uh, medical material, but very important is the, uh, the, the the daily life supporting. Because once you ask the person to uh, isolation, and we need to have a, a lot of volunteer give them the support, is daily life support to help them. And also multidisciplinary research, and also we do a, a public health communication. This is also very important. This can the uh, immediate uh, the public health communication can stop the rumor. 
here, this is the, that we do something in, in Shanghai. It's also similar that Shanghai is a city we have nearly, we call 25 million population residents. And we are a small city with high density of the population. Um, but within the, of course, we have, have the imported cases, but fortunately we have very sensitive uh, uh, surveillance system. The first case that imported into into Shanghai at the uh, we I we diagnosed these cases at her first attendees to the clinic in the January in January 2016. And the second days we do PCR and we almost can uh, can identify this is the COVID-19. And then. The day, two days later, that the sequencing, the gene sequencing, also confirmed by China CDC. So this, the first case we found, is in a very short time, and all the other cases is also similar. We almost taken about average one day that we do a diagnosis of the case, and we almost take it as quickly as uh, as possible. We try to find out do the trace contacts. Trace, uh, trace contact, contact tracing, and also find out the contact person. So to the end of the, uh, and we also have all these measures, intervention measures that we uh, we done in Shanghai. So as a result, here you will see. Until now, we only have 341 domestic cases in total, and most of them are cured. Cured. There is no medical staff be infected, and uh, and also now nowadays we mainly have the overseas imported cases. Um, we have uh, 341 imported cases right now, and all the cases we do testing and 14 days quarantine, and we found no zero death cases, and we found no asymptomatic case. This is mainly the the the, the effect. Uh, of the response in Shanghai. So uh, what I would like to talk in about, this is very important as uh, impo uh, th th this area like Shanghai, as many the uh, imported cases. Again, I want to uh, stressing that early identification, the testing, tracing, isolation is important to stop the transmission in the community. Um, for the post-pandemic measures, uh, I think the, uh, the three line now it is that we do quarantine importer and board, and uh, the second is self protection taken by the general population. I think this is important because we 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 uh, back to the uh, daily life, and we have a lot, but still there is possibly there there is the infected cases that will happen in our neighborhood. So do the face masks early added. Uh, uh, it's important and uh, taking the self protecting, uh, uh, keeping the social distancing also important. So, we ask the older population how uh, uh, increase their capacity to protect themselves and increase their, their knowledge, keep uh, informing them about the uh, epidemic, the, the procedure of the epidemic. And the third line is, of course, is the testing early diagnosis and uh, to try to find out the at the first uh, attendance of their uh, to the clinic, we try to find out the cases. So this is a very, very important. Uh, so that is the whole picture. What I, I would like to share with all of you, the major experience in China that we do uh, the response to COVID-19. So we still have a lot of knowledge gap. What do we know about the virus? We know the virus have highly effective human to human transmission and also case fatality ratio in Wuhan is the is outbreak area is about 60%, but out of Wuhan, the rest of China is less than 1%. So that shows if you do early uh, diagnosis and treatment could be lower down the case of fatality in a very, very lower ratio. And we, uh, but we still have a lot of question we don't know. Uh, uh, whether the the animal origin and the na national reservoir of the where it is, uh, what kind of animal they are, and uh, does the temperature affect the effectiveness of the transmission? And we still don't know because we uh, we know that all these days we didn't find even we found out the infected person and the 
a positive case, the, found out the case, but we didn't find that severe cases among them. So is that mean, means the temperature will affect the effectiveness of the transmission? We don't know. And uh, recently, we also have the one outbreak in, Be in, in, in Beijing, I show you. So in Beijing, um, uh, I think everyone uh, read the newspaper know almost the, the, uh, the outbreak. Just uh, last week, outbreak in a massive food uh, market positive examples are detected in the environment. And approximately eight, eight, uh, eight, uh, 80 confirmed cases, now it's over 80, uh, uh, is reported. And the, but, but the examples in other markets is negative, the only positive in that market. And the whole, uh, whole genome sequence found that uh, probably euro string, uh, be careful, I didn't see that from Europe. It is it's talking about the virus itself. The virus is, shows that it is a European strain. So the transmission through international trade is through the code because we find that there are uh, positive examples from the salmon. So that, that and we also notice that similar outbreak were also reported in Korea, US, and Germany. So we, we have these outbreak leave us a lot of questions need to know because in the past we found it's from animal, but what kind of is from fish that the salmon can infect the COVID-19 or coronavirus? Yes, possibly. So oh, it's just uh, polluted by the virus. So we don't know. We need to go further research about this. So. And about the transmission of the disease, we know the uh, lower confirmed case co uh, counts was intense quarantine and the social distancing. And uh, but we don't know is that uh, when will the ongoing transmission in a high burden country such as the uh, in, in US, Brazil, Russia, and India be controlled? Um, uh, everyone talking about the second wave, second outbreak in the coming winter. We will have to, do we have these kind of, uh, uh, the epidemic again, uh, we need to see, we need to, to do the close uh, monitoring of the trends of the old epidemic. And then one, another one that's also very important that they're talking about asymptotum infection. Is there any uh, asymptotum infection? And uh, how about the, uh, exact proportion of the hidden infection among all the total infection, uh, infection infected population. So we 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 trying to find out. Yes, we can. We do some. It's a very very lower level, but still we cannot until we know don't know what kind of transmission model that can cause uh, how many proportion of the hidden infection. So this is also leave us another question that we need to do a, a lot of research on this. Of course, we have a lot of clinical features. Uh, we don't know uh, about the drugs, about the, the, the uh, disease process, and what is the many, many uh, the reason caused uh, just by the, uh, the cause pneumonia, but also they also uh, affected the heart, and the other uh, important organs. So what is the mechanism? And also the vaccine clinical trial going on, uh, I said, yes, we have vaccine right now, but whether they're effective or not, we need to see. So they, all these knowledges that we don't know at this moment. So before the uh, final slides, before vaccine, successfully. I have some comments on this. I think from China's this parent, uh, experiences in, in, in the epidemic, uh, anti-epidemic, I found a very important is three points. One is to quickly establish the national command system to un uh, unified multi-sectoral cooperation and the efficient and the flex keep flexibility during different stage. This is important. And again, if we're talking about the measures, testing plus tracing plus isolating in early stage is very, very important to stop the community transmission and to stop the large 
uh, 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 epidemic in that area. And the third is important is to reduce the fatality. The key issue is early diagnosis, play early supportive therapy before we have effective drugs. So this is a very, very, we cannot wait. Once you found the a person diagnosed the person and carefully look at the symptom and to give them early support like the, uh, the ear vacants. This is very, very important. So I, this is, is the many experiences that we have. If we're talking only three points, this is the most important issue. Thank you very much. Over, thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Professor Wu. That's a very, very interesting and uh, comprehensive um, update on the China uh, responses and of course the strategy as well as um, you know what we could discuss later on in the panel discussion is how do we go forward with some of these uh, knowledge gap. Okay, so I'd like to introduce uh, Prof. Dr. Uh, Ann Wattle, our next speaker, who is the Associate Director General of the Epidemiology Public Health Impact as well as Clinical Development and the head of the Clinical Development and Regulatory Affairs at the IVI, the International Vaccine Institute in South Korea. And she has over 20 years of experience in epidemiological study, clinical research from phase one <clears throat> to phase four study, and has a uh, um, common technical document development expertise. So um, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Walter has extensive experience in the field of epidemiological and clinical research and academy research agency. And she has also been with the private sector pharmaceutical industry before joining IBI in 2018. So Dr. Walter, the floor is yours. Okay, um, so first of all, um, thank you for the International Life Sciences Institute for the invitation um, to be contributing to this webinar. Um, I've been invited to uh, give a talk on leveraging the private-public partnership model um, in COVID-19 pandemic response. So I, I will be highlighting a few digital tools that have been used in Korea, as well as the vaccine landscape where we stand in terms of vaccine development. So this is my uh, disclaimer slide. Uh, as mentioned by uh, Ms. Boon early on, I'm, I, I work at IVI. I'm, I'm leading the group uh, doing clinical trials um, for uh, IVI, and I'm also uh, in charge of the, um, uh, I'm part of the EPIC um, department. So my presentation is actually within the scope of IVI mandate, and I have no actual or potential conflict, in, in, in conflict of interest uh, for this presentation. So here is the presentation content. Uh, there are three uh, components of my presentation. I will touch briefly on the pandemic situation that was already um, presented by Professor Yu previously, and I will focus on South Korea, what has been done since the first case was um, reported in Korea. And then I will talk about the IVI and PPP model, um, how to contribute to the pandemic response, leveraging that model. And then a few uh, slides on the vaccine uh, development landscape and the timeline. Uh, we're expecting to have a safe and effective vaccine uh, to combat COVID-19. So as you have seen previously, uh, globally, um, there are more than 7.8 million total confirmed cases that were, that were shown by uh, Professor Yu previously more than 430,000 um, 430, global uh, deaths. And when you look at the uh, trend, um, the number of cases is still uh, increasing globally uh, with the case fatality rate that is about 5.5% at the global level. Whereas um, in Korea, South Korea, the first case was reported uh, on January 2020, and uh, it was based on imported cases actually. And then later on in South Korea, there was an exponential outbreak that began on February 18 uh, from clusters um, uh, in Korea in two provinces um, from a church uh, group. Uh, it was, I would say, the main epidemiological link for the exponential increase of cases in Korea. And then while we are seeing the curve has been flattened uh, since March in South Korea, uh, actually, most of the cases um, are mild or do, or do not require hospitalization. 
And actually most of the cases or death have been reported in elderly population or those with um, medical underlying, um, underlying medical conditions. Um, there has been uh, an increase of cases um, in Korea, but now we're, I would say, uh, under control, uh, thanks to the measures that have been put in place uh, by the Korean uh, government. So what are the measures that have been put in place? Um, so we need to remember that Korea has experienced a MERS outbreak, MERS curve uh, outbreak back in 2015. And I think it was somehow a turning point uh, for Korea because since then they had established, uh, implemented a domestic law that is called Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act um, that has been, I would say, used uh, and leveraged um, in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. So Korean authority has strengthened uh, their preparedness plan and surveillance system for the outbreak um, and to try to control uh, the um, COVID-19 uh, in Korea. And the response system in Korea is based on, I would say, the three T approach, uh, the test, trace, and treat approach. And that has also different components to include, for instance, to block the entry um, at the country, at the airport, um, to avoid lockdown, actually, of the whole country. Um, there was also um, uh, early detection of the confirmed cases that is part of the test approach um, to screen rapidly uh, the uh, cases uh, at the airport, for instance. And there was also a, a trace a response um, of, to the outbreak um, to investigate the cases um, and also to isolate um, the cases and the contact, uh, and then to disinfect on-site um, uh, areas uh, and also to um, uh, disclose um, the different uh, confirmed cases that were observed in Korea to public. So that's part of the trace approach uh, to respond to the outbreak. And in terms of treatment, there were also a rapidly um, allocation of beds based on the severity of the cases and the provision of uh, treatment facilities and equipment um, in different uh, healthcare uh, facilities. Uh, in terms of resources, um, Korea has um, a tremendous amount of resources um, working at the designated hospital dedicated to COVID-19 uh, management, as well as allocated living and treatment centers uh, in Korea. That's another pillar that has uh, played a key role um, in the control of the outbreak. And then treatment of the patient, general operation, um, general patients uh, remain um, and the hospital are operating also for, for that population. So in a nutshell, um, the whole current response system has been based on information sharing transparently and promptly. Uh, and at the beginning of the uh, increase of the cases, there were regular uh, briefing, for instance, on a daily basis. Uh, at the early, very early stage of the outbreak, uh, with uh, instantaneously, um, you know, um, information around the different confirmed cases, different places they were um, documented or they were reported, and then there were um, the tracing system put in place right away, uh, and also people were um, asked to call uh, a, a call center if they want to have any information uh, related to their health or any other information related to COVID-19. So information sharing has been critical uh, to uh, respond to COVID-19. And the second one I wanted to emphasize as well is the um, citizen um, uh, behavior. Uh, they voluntarily uh, adhered to infection prevention and control measures. Um, and they have been very compliant with all the measures that um, the public actually was asked to uh, contribute and to apply uh, in their day-to-day -day activities or, or daily life. In terms of innovative infection prevention control measures, again, um, as I mentioned, and you will see in the next slide, there, was, um, there were procedures put in place, special entry procedures um, designated um, to uh, the airport, for instance, to block the entry. Uh, and to um, block the spread of the virus without a need for a uh, lockdown, uh, total lockdown of the country or any um, restriction in terms of movement of, of, of the population. Um, so this is very innovative, I would say, approach as well um, to ensure that um, there's no lockdown um, of the country and no lockdown of the society uh, in, in Korea. 
Another um, point I wanted to emphasize here is the um, extensive diagnostic testing uh, that has been um, rapidly put in place. Um, and for instance, you will see in the next slide the different uh, testing uh, that have been, um, I would say, approved uh, or regions or, 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 or kits that have been approved in the short term frame by the regulatory agency in Korea um, to increase the number of diagnostic tests uh, that could be done per day. Um, so that's another um, highlight, I would say, uh, that is of importance for the response uh, system. And last but not least, healthcare professionals um, have been mobilized and have been very dedicated to um, patient treatment and uh, cases management as well. For instance, some healthcare professionals went to the region. Um, those that are experiencing uh, a surge in the confirmed um, cases, there were volunteers going there and contribute uh, to the fight against COVID-19. So these are, I would say, the different um, highlights uh, of the current response system that have led to um, flattening the curve. On this slide, I just wanted to, uh, I will not go uh, too much into detail, but to uh, emphasize uh, what I just mentioned earlier on, there was no, um, I mean, the borders actually were kept open um, and there were these border screening procedure in Korea. And for instance, for on the left-hand side, you can see the symptomatic cases. So what has been done for, for those passengers or travelers um, that are symptomatic? So what was done was, uh, for instance, these special entry procedures for inbound travelers, um, it was put in place for the travelers coming from China uh, at the beginning uh, on February 4. And then instead of um, putting um, an entry ban um, um, uh, for the overall um, country, uh, and then they had extended actually um, to all inbound travelers uh, from April onwards, um, not only from uh, those coming from China. So the passengers were requested to self-isolate for 14 days at home or at the related uh, facilities, and they were also asked to um, install a self-diagnosis um, application um, and then they uh, also receive a very regular thorough uh, monitoring uh, from the healthcare professionals um, in, in Korea uh, to follow up their um, medical conditions uh, once they enter uh, Korea. So these are um, the measures put in place for the symptomatic uh, cases. Um, and then um, at the airport, actually, the travelers uh, were required to undergo testing at the airport, uh, regardless of the nationality. Uh, and while awaiting the results, um, they were um, awaiting uh, at, at um, facilities and then uh, they were put under isolation and treatment at the hospital or, or living um, uh, uh, treatment center if the result turned out to be uh, positive. Or they were asked to have self-isolation for 14 days if the result is uh, negative for the symptomatic cases. On the other hand, um, there was also a procedure in place um, for asymptomatic cases for inbound travelers. Um, again, there are um, also, for instance, for the asymptomatic Korean citizens, uh, they were put under self-isolation for 14 days. Um, and then, uh, of course, they were required to undergo testing when they uh, show symptoms. Um, and for, for the one, in, for instance, coming from Europe or US, they were required to undergo testing within three days from arrival. So depending on your um, status or your visa, whether you are foreigner with long-term status or foreigner with short-term um, uh, stay, you know, there are different measures that are put in place to self-quarantine, um, and they are shown on this slide. There are some exceptions uh, from isolation. Um, on the right hand side, you see those that are uh, having uh, visa holders as A1 or A2 or flight attendants. Um, they were required to undergo testing at the airport. And again, if they are confirmed negative, to install their self diagnosis um, application uh, for active monitoring. Uh, and they also were receiving a phone calls by a call center. So these are the measures put in place uh, at the airport. Again, um, the aim, I believe, was to still cook keep the borders open um, while controlling um, the spread of the virus with the travelers uh, coming in. So since my talk is related to um, uh, tools, um, 
and, and I just wanted to uh, highlight here uh, on this slide the different uh, self-diagnosis app that I was mentioning earlier on related to the spatial entry procedures. Um, so you can see the different um, uh, apps that were uh, requested to be um, uh, implemented for the travelers. Um, and on the right hand side, for those that are living in Korea, there were also different applications um, on our handphone, for instance, to receive um, uh, emergency alert. For instance, when we have confirmed uh, cases in one area, where we are um, uh, close by, then we receive uh, this kind of information for, for you, for instance, to avoid those places um, that was, um, uh, I mean, um, reported as, uh, that were reported as um, uh, with confirmed cases. Uh, and there are also some uh, information uh, related to prevention measures that you can receive on your handphone. Uh, and then for foreigners, uh, there, are, there is this emergency ready app um, where you can find, for instance, a healthcare facility that is close to your apartment, for instance. So these are the different um, applications that you could use in Korea to be uh, well informed on the situation in terms of number of cases, in terms of um, measures, what to do uh, for for public. So another uh, example I wanted to highlight on this one is the drive-through screening stations. Uh, there were um, different stations in Seoul, for instance, and I believe that's the case as well in, in, in different provinces. The screening stations were set up at the public health centers uh, and healthcare institutions as well. And uh, the aim of that was to increase the testing institution uh, and somehow decreasing at the same time the burden on the hospital. So this is just a few pictures of the drive-through screening. Um, station that people can uh, go and get tested um, for um, confirmation of, of COVID-19, for instance. Now, as I had alluded to that, uh, one of the uh, three T uh, pillars, test, press, and treat, was uh, about the testing. And as I mentioned earlier on, um, in Korea, um, the testing has been really implemented very, very quickly at, at the beginning. Uh, to start with 3,000 testing per day on February 7, to increase up to over 20,000, I think now it's 23,000 per day since May, um, to ensure that we can really um, detect rapidly uh, the virus spread uh, and somehow to block um, the, the spread of the, of the virus in, in community. So on this slide, you can see that uh, in Korea there are um, uh, there is a number of, of um, testing that have been approved uh, either to be used uh, in Korea for emergency domestic use or for exportations. And most, most of the uh, testing are, are related to uh, RT-PCR. You have also uh, serology testing with IgM, IgG. So this is just to show that uh, there are testing for um, in Korea use, uh, and then uh, there are also um, manufacturers that have um, uh, the testing approved for exportation. Another highlight uh, related to the uh, strategy for COVID-19 response uh, in Korea. So with all these measures put in place, uh, it has led to this uh, situation where we have um, the newly, um, the daily cases uh, remain below two digits, um, I mean, uh, around two digits below three digits actually. Um, and, and there are, um, you know, cases, um, small um, cluster here and there, uh, sporadic cases, but the number remains now uh, below 50 since uh, 13th of, of June. And again, um, the response plan from Korea um, against COVID-19 has been uh, really um, remarkable. And, and I, ha I wanted to highlight again, you know, the three elements uh, that have led to this situation, uh, openness, uh, with uh, the border um, kept open and also the society uh, was kept open. In other words, uh, the shops were not closed. Uh, there was no shutdown of the restaurant, no shutdown um, of uh, supermarkets, um, and people were still uh, able to commute, although uh, some institutions have um, recommended to work from home, um, but people were um, able to uh, move around uh, while having all the uh, physical measures to wear a mask um, and to have the hygiene measures um, wherever you go in Korea. So openness has been uh, 
instrumental, I would say. Um, transparency, again, and I think this uh, Infectious Disease Control and Prevention Act uh, has been um, used and has been also very um, helpful uh, to ensure the public's right uh, to be informed uh, on a timely manner uh, and also to respond to the outbreak uh, on a timely manner. And last but not least, the civic engagement. That is something, uh, again, I have to say, it's remarkable in Korea to see uh, people are very, very compliant. Uh, and they have been constantly com uh, compliant with the public measures um, that have been um, uh, you know, uh, regularly reminded um, to wear uh, face masks, um, to be uh, very disciplined with the self-quarantine measures, and to also uh, maintain um, social distancing. Uh, and I believe all these measures have really helped flattened the curve uh, as we have seen. And again, the number of cases now in Korea remain um, below uh, below 50 uh, per day. Allowing the opening of the schools again, uh, opening of some um, uh, facilities um, to go back uh, to a certain uh, normalcy, not the normalcy as we are used to in the past, but uh, people now are, 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 are free to, to move around while keeping all the measures that have been put in place. Uh, for the last um, a few months. Now, um, what I wanted to uh, touch on is how uh, has IVI been contributing to COVID-19 response from Korea? So for us, those of you who are not familiar with IVI, actually we are an international organization uh, dedicated to enabling the world's most vulnerable people to have full productive lives by accelerating R&D research and development for critical uh, vaccines. Um, in other words, um, IVI mission is to accelerate vaccine R&D for uh, global health. And I believe it's more than ever relevant nowadays, um, given the global need uh, and the urgency to have a solution against COVID-19. So IVI is an international organization, not-for-profit organization, uh, fully dedicated to global health. Um, we have been um, established um, in Seoul, uh, that is our headquarters, um, uh, since 1997 um, upon the uh, United Nations Development Program. Um, we have a team um, that is composed of um, 145 people now uh, from 14 nationalities for our workforce, um, and we have been doing field programs, clinical trials in uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And in terms of signatory countries, we have 37 countries, including WHO, and the one that has lately joined us is Madagascar. So in terms of activity, uh, IVI has a quite unique um, situation. Uh, when you look at the whole vaccine development, um, and uh, we have actually different activities um, all the way from different steps, uh, from uh, lab activities to vaccination implementation on the field. We have a big team looking into the uh, epidemiology, the burden of the disease, uh, to also look into the uh, cost of illness, um, economics, uh, health economics uh, research. Um, that's uh, very important to look into the disease itself and also um, cost of fitness uh, when, we, when we talk about vaccine and vaccination. And then uh, we have um, um, a, a group of experts looking into the preclinical um, stage, uh, whether we are looking into the um, uh, preclinical studies in animal or vaccine process development. Uh, we have uh, our uh, lab people here in IVI to uh, look into that. Uh, as well. And then in terms of uh, clinical trials, when you move from animal to human, you need to um, implement the first in uh, human studies and then followed by subsequent phases of the clinical trial. So we have a team dedicated to that, to look into the design of the clinical trials, the clinical development of the vaccine, and also to ensure we have a clinical operation in place to implement the trial on, on the ground. And what we uh, usually do, for instance, in IVI, if we uh, develop a vaccine in-house, is that we uh, usually take transfer to a developing country vaccine manufacturer um, for them to scale up um, the production and then for uh, commercialization afterwards. Um, and IVI is um, uh, also uh, involved in that part for the tech transfer. 
And all the vaccines we're working on, we uh, want to bring them to WHO uh, pre-qualification to ensure that there is a global access uh, of the vaccine to low and middle income countries, for instance, in particular. And then, as I mentioned, we are uh, also involved in multiple activities um, to inform uh, policymakers and to contribute to uh, capacity building. Um, so all in all, you see that IBI has uh, key roles um, in different steps um, to bring you know, a vaccine from lab all the way to uh, vaccination uh, implementation on the ground. So how do we do that? Um, we do that with multiple partners. Um, and, uh, and thinking of the PPP model, we have more than 150 partners worldwide. And you can see we have a variety of partners um, having, for instance, a very strong support from government. Um, we have strong support from a Korea government. We also have very strong support, outstanding support from Sweden and India in terms of um, contribution to our uh, institution to function. And we have partners from academia. You can see on the right hand side different uh, partners we have been working with in terms of university, research institute, and so on and so forth um, to do uh, clinical trials or any other research. And we have also funding uh, coming from uh, philanthropic organizations such as uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, or Welcome Trust um, uh, to help us in our mission. And then we are partnering. Uh, we also receive uh, support and funding from uh, other global health organizations such as CEPI. And also we have uh, projects with Gavi, for instance, to, to name a few. Uh, and last but not least, industry uh, as partner. Um, we have some um, um, industry partners uh, in our project as well, either they are located in Korea or beyond uh, Korea in other uh, countries, uh, global partners uh, for industry. So these are the different partners we are um, working with uh, to bring a vaccine to, um, uh, I would say, uh, to global health need. Now, what, have be, what has IVI been doing in terms of COVID-19 research activities uh, as part of our uh, response? So we have um, been engaged in multiple um, angles. Uh, we have been uh, doing laboratory vaccine evaluation support for um, um, uh, current um, manufacturers, for instance. You can see uh, the name of uh, some of them here. We have been collaborating also with Canada, uh, Vido Intervac, um, to look into uh, vaccine candidate, and we are also working with current company on adjuvants. So uh, this is much more uh, in the preclinical stage, uh, laboratory stage for uh, COVID-19 research activities. We also have um, uh, funding uh, through Innovio, uh, funding from CEPI to do a phase one slash two clinical trial soon in Korea. Uh, that's something we are really, really excited um, to get into soon uh, for uh, the clinical trials uh, in, in Korea using the uh, DNA vaccine. And we have also um, been working uh, on uh, other SARS vaccine uh, with two um, organizations. One is Baylor College of Medicine in the US and another um, group of Bionet from Thailand and Insular in France. Uh, to look into other um, uh, projects related to SARS vaccine candidates. Um, in terms of um, disease surveillance, uh, we had funding, uh, we had received funding from uh, Swedish uh, International Development Agency um, to uh, look into um, IVI field sites uh, to see how we can strengthen the epidemiological studies there and to come up with epi data that is really needed for um, to inform uh, the late stage of development of the uh, vaccine trial, for instance. So we uh, have received funding from Swedish uh, authority or agency, and we also have funding from Germany uh, to um, look into um, COVID-19 response for some countries, uh, for instance, in Bangladesh, Cambodia, and, and Vietnam, um, to see how we can also support those countries um, in terms of disease surveillance. And then uh, at the um, multilateral engagement, uh, our Director General has been invited um, to uh, this initiative um, that is called Group for Global Infectious Disease Response that has been launched lately uh, upon the uh, current authority uh, to look into um, a multilateral uh, engagement uh, and see how uh, we can uh, contribute to uh, COVID-19 response globally. 
And then uh, Finland commitment is the, uh, another one we had uh, received lately. Uh, we had received some funding uh, from Finland um, to, to help us um, uh, with our activities related to COVID-19 uh, response as well. So this is just to um, list uh, a few um, projects we are working on um, to uh, contribute to COVID-19 uh, response. Now, my last part of the presentation is uh, dedicated to vaccine development landscape because we are in an, uh, an organization working on vaccines. So I wanted to spend a few uh, minutes here on vaccine development and the timeline. So remember, this is a novel virus and this is a novel vaccine to some extent that has emerged since end of last year. And as mentioned by Professor Yu, there is knowledge gap. We have seen that uh, on the disease, on, uh, on the transmission, on the other things, there is still a um, knowledge gap that we still need to um, uh, study and we need to come up with additional uh, research. Um, one of the questions um, is um, the immunity. Because for some vaccines, we know clearly what is expected um, in terms of protection. But for this one, we don't know. Um, uh, in terms of infection immunity, what is going to be triggered when we give the vaccine, uh, whether the immunity will last uh, long. Um, and bearing in mind that, for instance, uh, for coronavirus uh, infections, with human coronavirus infection, um, not this one in particular, but there has been a description of waning of immunity uh, that is commonly observed actually with the human coronavirus infections, um, uh, common cold, for instance. So that's something we need to address. Um, uh, the immunity and, and, and the protection, whether it lasts long. Um, another thing we need to understand also is um, what kind of immune response will be triggered with the vaccine, whether it's a T cell or B cells. Uh, do we need to have cellular immune response and humoral response um, to have a well-balanced um, immune response in the end to get protected? So that's something we need to um, also study when it comes to uh, vaccine development. And then uh, on this one, um, as you, you know, there are a good animal model for some diseases um, uh, and that can you know, um, predict what you will see in human. But for this one, uh, what is the appropriate animal model? We don't know uh, really. So that's another uh, unknown uh, for, for, for vaccine. Uh, and we need to have, of course, animal studies um, and we need to uh, look into that in, in, in preclinical stage before we move into human. Um, but animal model will not tell you, you know, everything uh, that is expected in human. So you still need to get into uh, human um, uh, to, to get the vaccine tested and to look at the safety profile of the vaccine, to look at the immune response elicited by the vaccine candidate. And then for this particular virus, there has been questions around the safety issue, whether the vaccination will increase, um, you know, um, the subsequent uh, natural infection. Um, so that's something uh, we need to also address uh, for this particular SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. So what is remarkable, I have to say, um, is that since the vaccine, sorry, since the virus was um, reported first uh, back in December 2019, there have been um, a, a increased number of, of vaccine candidates, a very impressive number of vaccine candidates uh, that are now being studied, more than 180 vaccine candidates as of June 10. Um, and there are different uh, types of vaccines. You can have a virus, a viral vaccines, uh, whether they are inactivated or weakened, um, killed vaccines or live activated vaccine. You have also viral vector as a, another vaccine candidate. Uh, you can have uh, nucleic acid um, vaccines with DNA or uh, messenger RNA vaccines. Uh, and there's another um, uh, type of vaccine that is the protein-based uh, vaccine. So you can see that uh, there, are a variety, there is a variety of vaccines uh, being studied, uh, either in preclinical stage or in clinical stage. And we have now 15 vaccines uh, that are now uh, being tested in human. Um, each of these vaccine platform um, has advantages and limitations. Uh, and the important characteristics for a vaccine, uh, I would say they should include um, 
speed in terms of characteristic of the vaccine, um, you know, flexibility of manufacture, um, manufacturing process, a safety profile, uh, and reactogenicity profile. Uh, these are important characteristics of the vaccine. Um, and to uh, elicit a proper uh, immune response um, and um, humoral response and cellular response as well. Uh, durability of the immunity, that is something um, we need to also look into as I just uh, mentioned earlier on. Uh, and the cost of the manufacturing um, as well as the vaccine stabilities. So these are the important characteristics um, that we need to, um, of course, um, come up with uh, when it comes to uh, vaccine development. So it's good to see um, that there are multiple vaccines being uh, developed and studied with different constructs, uh, different technologies, uh, but no single vaccine or vaccine platform alone is likely to meet the global need. And so a strategic approach to the multi-pronged endeavor is absolutely critical. Now, um, you might have heard about um, timeline. How, how much time does it take to um, develop a vaccine? And um, usually, um, it takes, uh, in average, five to 10 years to make a vaccine. Uh, when you look at this um, scheme, uh, the different processes you need to go through for any vaccine, you know, from the uh, discovery stage, when you first look into the antigen, the virus itself, um, and then all the way, you want to uh, go through the preclinical stage. It takes some, some time there. And then you want to generate um, the safety data uh, in human. Uh, once you have all the green light to move into human, to generate the safety data first in a small um, sample size in, with the phase one. And then uh, once everything is going well, you want to, of course, e expand your clinical database to generate more information around the immune response and the safety profile in the larger sample size before you get to the phase three. Uh, that is um, um, a large scale efficacy trial if you want to go for efficacy trial and to still accrue information around the uh, safety profile of your vaccine before you reach the intimate stage of licensure. So all in all, it takes five to 10 years um, to do that at least. Now, you need to um, bear in mind as well um, it, take, it takes time, but when you look into a vaccine development, let's say you have 10 vaccines being uh, developed, only one will reach this ultimate stage of licensure. So again, the rate of failure is very high. Um, only one in 10 uh, will make it in the end. So now you have heard that there is um, a, a great sense of urgency to have a vaccine in addition to treatment for acute um, uh, situation. Um, people are talking about six to 12 months. And I think we um, that's something that has already been established to some extent to have compressed uh, timelines for a novel vaccine to go you know, through all the processes uh, from preclinical to um, uh, vaccine uh, vaccination. So that's something that um, may be feasible. And when you look at the uh, recent years on this last slide, on the timeline. Uh, I just wanted to uh, focus here on, on, on the different um, other pathogens of interest. For instance, uh, the green bar represents the time since first identification of a virus to the first um, phase one. Um, the blue bar represents the time since the first major outbreak to the first phase one, and orange bar represents the time it took to get a licensed vaccine. So if we take, for instance, dengue, uh, for instance, that the, this virus, uh, it took 38 years from the first outbreak, uh, major outbreak, to the first uh, phase one uh, study. And then it took more than 70 years to get a licensed vaccine. So you can see it takes time. And as you can imagine, it's costly. Now, if you take the, the example of Ebola, for Ebola, it took 24 years from the first major outbreak to the first phase one study and 10 years for licensed vaccine. So it has been shortened already. Now, if we focus on coronavirus, uh, coronaviruses, for instance, if you look at the SARS-CoV uh, virus, it took 24 months from the major outbreak to the first phase one study. And when you look at MERS um, curve, um, it took 22 months uh, from the major first major outbreak to the first uh, phase one study. Now, looking at the current COVID-19 and the SARS-CoV-2, 
when you look at the first cases that appeared uh, in, in December in China, and then uh, the virus was sequenced in January, then it took three months from the major outbreak in China to the first phase one trial. So you can see that uh, we have been somehow used to strengthen and shorten the timeline already uh, for the last couple of years. Um, and it's really remarkable. And I believe that we can um, have a, a vaccine. Um, of course, uh, bearing in mind that we need to show the safety profile, the immune response, um, uh, we can make it, um, given the high awareness now we all have with COVID-19. And there's a great sense of urgency for everybody to have a, a tool to combat uh, COVID-19. And we also have a great engagement from the different countries, different authority, uh, national regulatory agencies as well, to fast track um, clinical trials uh, for um, implementation on the ground uh, to get the vaccine going through the different stages of clinical development. And, and I think nowadays for this uh, virus, um, when you look at the different clinical development plan, uh, we are all talking about compressed study design with a phase one um, going quickly and then uh, you follow by the phase two, phase one slash two, and then you move uh, to the phase three uh, once everything's going well in terms of safety and immune response. So uh, it's very compressed timeline. Um, and actually um, that's something we are into completely in terms of vaccinology. It's a new era in vaccinology to be working in a very um, uh, compressed um, timeline to have a, a novel vaccine available for uh, for the public. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wato. And I think that uh, we are all hopeful, and uh, it's very interesting to look at the extended timeline. And now we are trying to compress it. So thank you, and then I think we look forward to good discussion. Um, our next speaker is Professor June Kunisawa, who is the uh, director of. Uh, for um, the National Institute of Biomedical In Innovation, Health and Nutrition. He also is the uh, visiting professor at both Osaka University as well as the Tokyo University. So Professor Kunisawa, um, you're next on the speaking. Yeah. So I would like to start my talk by showing my sincere appreciation to the committee members to provide me this opportunity to present our recent studies in this great webinar. Um, following two excellent presentations, I would like to show our recent findings on the involvement of nutrient in the maintenance and regulation of the immune system. Um, I don't have any COI in this talk. So now we have to consider to survive an unexperienced situation caused by COVID-19. Many researchers are now conducting the development of medicine and vaccine to fight against COVID-19, but it still takes time to develop effective one. Therefore, we need to protect ourselves by classical and traditional method to prevent physical attachment with virus, such as gathering, hand washing, and keeping social distance. Another thing we notice is differences in the basic immune activities among each individual. The difference in basal immune activity led to different outcome. If people are exposed to pathogens in the same environment, some people get sick with serious symptom, but the other have no onset or asymptomatic. A similar issue is observed in the vaccine. When people are immunized with same vaccines, someone obtained very good vaccine effect, but the others do not. So suggesting that immune responses to pathogens and vaccines have a large individual difference. 
This difference is likely to be determined by basal immunoactivity, which is influenced by lifestyles such as sleep, diet, and exercise. Today's my talk. I'm going to show our researches by using various omics analysis together with big data analysis to reveal the immunologic function of diet and nutrient as well as the commensal bacteria to survive in the new pandemic era. The nutrient I would like to introduce first today is vitamins. Vitamins are essential nutrient for a variety of biological reactions, including immune responses. Our study revealed that rather than requiring all the vitamins in all immune responses, certain vitamins are required for particular immune responses. In this study, we focused on intestinal IgA responses, and so I would like to briefly introduce the immune system to produce IgA antibodies in the intestine. The intestine is divided into two parts. One is Peyer's purchase, and another one is lamina propria, which is also known as villi. Pathogens such as bacteria and virus, and also vaccines, are taken into Peyer's purchase, where they are captured by dendritic cells and presented to T cells and B cells. Then, B cells are directed to produce IgA antibodies specific for pathogens and vaccines. Then, B cells leave the payers' purchases and migrate to the lamina propria, where they further differentiate it into IgA-producing plasma cells. IgA antibodies are then secreted into the lumen through epithelial cell, where they bind to pathogens and toxin to eliminate their pathogenicity. We also know similar systems are exist in the respiratory tract, so this IgA antibody mediated immunosurveillance is also very important for the protection of respiratory pathogens, including COVID-19. Vitamin B1 is known to be involved in energy metabolism, especially acting as a coenzyme of pyruvate dehydrogenase, PDH, and 2-oxoglutaric acid dehydrogenase, OGDH, in the TCA cycle. Therefore, vitamin B1 deficiency would lead to the impaired TCA cycle mediated energy generation. I show here the imaging mass spectrometry data to visualize the expression of citrate, a typical metabolite of TCA cycle. A strong signal of citrate is observed in the intestine of mice fed with vitamin B1 sufficient normal diet, suggesting that TCA cycle works well. On the other hand, in the intestine of mice fed with vitamin B1 deficient diet, the citrate derived signal is very weak, indicating that the TCA cycle is impaired. <laughs> Related to energy metabolism in intestinal IgA production, we found that the intestinal B cells show dramatic changes in energy metabolism during their differentiation. B cells present in the payers' purchase acquire energy from the TCA cycle from amino acid and fatty acid rather than glycolytic pathway. When B cell differentiate into IgA producing plasma cell, they additionally use 
glycolytic pathway for energy generation. Also, they shift the energy balance between the catabolism and anabolism from generation to consumption of energy to make antibodies. In the impaired condition of the TCA cycle caused by vitamin B1 deficiency, B cells in the payers' patches cannot acquire energy from anywhere, so they cannot survive, whereas IgA-producing plasma cell can survive. Consistent with these findings, the most remarkable phenotype caused by vitamin B1 deficiency is the reduction of the B cells, which is associated with the decreased size of the payers' patches in the intestine, as well as the reduced size of the spleen and the other lymph node. We found those immunodeficiencies associated with impaired immunofunctions, such as a low vaccine efficacy, high susceptibility to infection. Indeed, we found that the antibody responses against the vaccine are significantly reduced in mice maintained with vitamin B1 deficient diet. These findings collectively suggested that although vitamin B1 is a very small and simple nutrient, the influence of its deficiency on immunological damage is so big. Now, we learn the importance of vitamin B1 to maintain appropriate immunofunctions against pathogens and vaccines. And so, we have to take sufficient amount of vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 is known to be abundant in pork, sesame, soybean, and so on. And garlic and green onion contain irisin that bind to vitamin B1 to convert to alicyamine, which exert a good absorption in the intestine and long-term retention in the blood, suggesting that good combination of diet to efficiently use vitamin B1. On the other hand, some kinds of fish, club, and commensal bacteria have enzymes known as cyaminase to degrade vitamin B1. So, utilization of vitamin B1 is not so simple, and so we should consider the combination of diet as well as the involvement of commensal bacteria. So, okay. So, second topic in my talk is dietary oil. So, various kinds of the dietary oil are available at supermarket. Although they look similar at grounds, their contents are totally different, which is determined by the fatty acid compositions as shown here. Among various fatty acid, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid are known to be essential fatty acid for human because we are not able to generate them by ourselves. Thus, the balance between the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acid in the body largely depends on the quality of dietary oil. It is generally considered that omega-3 fatty acid show anti-allergic and anti-inflammatory properties whereas omega-6 fatty acid possess pro-inflammatory activities. Studies from several groups, including us, identified biologically active lipid metabolite. Among various lipid metabolite, leukotrien B4 is a representative metabolite from omega-6 arachidonic acid 
and BLD1 act as a receptor for Ricotorian B4. So today's my talk, I'm going to show our recent findings about Ricotorian B4 BLD1 axis in the control of intestinal IgA responses. We initially examined the expression of BLT1 on B cells during the differentiation into the IgA producing plasma cells in the intestine, revealing that in the pairs purchase, no BLT1 was detected on naive B cells, but was expressed on IgA positive B cells, and its expression was maintained on IgA producing plasma cells in the intestinal lamina propria. These findings promoted us to examine the role of BLT1 in the intestinal IgA production. To address this, we already immunized BLT1 wild type and deficient mice with chorelatoxin and measured chorelatoxin specific fecal IgA production. The levels of chorelatoxin specific fecal IgA were lower in BLT1 deficient mice than in wild type mice. Consistently, immunized BLT1 deficient mice developed very severe diarrhea induced by oral challenge of high dose of chorelatoxin, which was same level as non-vaccinated naive wild type mice. These results indicate that BLT1 is important for inducing the antigen specific protective immunity against the intestinal pathogen. To make a long story short, I show here a cartoon slide to explain underlying mechanism. Naive B cells in the payers purchase did not express BLT1, but once they are differentiated into IgA positive B cells, they acquire BLT1 expression, which in turn induced MyD88 expression through the recognition of the Bucuturian B4 generated from omega-6 arachidonic acid. This change allows them to receive the stimulation from commensal bacteria, leading to their proliferation and the consequent increase of intestinal IgA production. So now I show that omega-6 fatty acid, especially leukotriene B4, enhances intestinal IgA responses. But at the same time, we have to be careful in case of the COVID-19, because excessive activation of immunity, especially induction of inflammatory responses, causes the virus-induced acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDF. In this issue, we realized that omega-3 fatty acid exert anti-inflammatory properties, and so, I would like to propose that the balance diet between the omega-3 and omega-6 create appropriate immunological environment to protect sufficient immunosurveillance without excessive inflammation. Based on this background, we have conducted cohort studies at various areas in Japan to analyze the relationship among diet, commensal bacteria, metabolite, and healthy condition, including the immunity. We established a big data analysis system using the bioinformatics technologies. This is not COVID-19 data, but I would like to show one example. So in this study, we measured influenza virus specific antibody one year after vaccination. We identified age is one of the critical factors to determine the efficacy, but 
some populations show high level of the antibodies in the same generations. We are now looking for factors such as diet and commensal bacteria affecting the vaccine efficacies. We also have a plan to do similar experiment for COVID-19. For big data analysis, we have established a database including all data and also analytical system by using bioinformatics system for the elucidation of the possible mechanism of the interaction between diet, commensal bacteria, and immunity. I would like to introduce our system briefly. When we click the ID, we can easily check various parameters such as commensal bacteria, diet, and immune parameters and metabolite with information about health status and medical disease history. We can also do um, interrelation analysis. As an example, so the list shown here includes the data of BMIs, uh, body weight and height, and so on. So in this setting, I chose gut microbiota composition, species, BMIs, and put search button to request the system to look for commercial bacteria correlated with BMI. This system immediately shows us the list of commensal bacteria, so in this case, negatively correlated with BMIs. And then we will isolate and culture the candidate bacteria for animal models to analyze causation relationship and underlying mechanism. So by using this system, we are trying to answer the unrevealed question of why the number of patients infected with COVID-19 is so small in Japan. Also, in the near future, we would like to establish a system for the precision vaccine to maximize vaccine effect. So at the end of my talk, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to many collaborators and financial support. I also extend my appreciation to many young, talented members in my lab at Osaka, Japan. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Kunisawa, uh, for a very interesting, and um, I think all of us are interested in knowing how to boost our immune system through diet. So this is a really, uh, for the nutritionists out there, probably there's something to for us to look forward to learning more. So I think we've come to the end of the three presentations. Thank you all speakers for a very exciting and enlightening insight. Uh, to uh, to uh, to the different areas on um, in China, Korea, and what is ongoing now in research in Japan. So I would like to, um, now to move on to our panel session, where I would like to invite Dr. Jeremy Lin, who will chair and moderate the panel session. Dr. Lin will also give a very brief update on the status in Singapore with regards to um, our next step in opening up the um, our. Um, what we call the circuit breaker. And Dr. Jeremy Lim is the co-director of the Global Health at Sosui Hock School of Public Health, National University of Singapore, where he works to enhance the cooperation capacity building and knowledge sharing across the region. He is also the co-founder and CEO of Emily, the first dedicated gut microbiome full service company in Southeast Asia. Dr. Lim has a special interest in ways that technology can increase health equity and access to care, to care. So Dr. Lim, the floor is yours and you have the permission to extend the discussion session um, due to the very interesting uh, presentation and we wanted to have really good discussion for this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Young. 
and a very good morning or good afternoon to all of you. Uh, we have had two very strong presentations on what's been the situation in China as well as in Korea, um, and one presentation about the role of nutrition. We are a little behind schedule, so I don't want to take time before we jump into the panel discussion, but I was asked to share a little about what's happening here in Singapore. And for those of you who are based here in here in Singapore, this is the first today that I thought the biggest news for really Singapore is that is that we have gone through eight weeks of a very tough uh, lockdown, which in Singapore is described as a circuit breaker and a phase two where shops can reopen, dining will be allowed, gymnasiums, swimming pools will all start to reopen. Uh, this will commence starting this this coming Friday, so that's good news for everybody. But a sobering note is that on the very same page, and this, um, but on the very same page, uh, below the story about phase two here in Singapore, we also um, see the headline about what Beijing's doing to contain the outbreak that's been linked to the to the market, and it's been reported that the market accounts for 90% of the fresh produce that that already Beijing residents consume. And maybe the final point that I'll note is that is to reinforce the, the really comments both from Korea as well as China that public communications and, and getting people to understand is so important. And it's really striking how in Singapore every single day the newspapers will have many advertisements scattered across the newspapers and especially on the front page about the safety measures and the role of individual or personal risk uh, really responsibility to make the uh, to really make the phase two uh, really successful and this is a theme that cuts across so we had curated the three presentations very carefully to really reinforce uh, two important lessons one is that we all have to learn from each other. And the Singapore story is really very simple, right? We've done everything that China and Korea have done, uh, learning from both these countries very, very carefully. And I think when we get into the panel, we will discuss how important is speed and decisiveness in implementing measures and personally as a as a public health professor i would say that the public health interventions are not difficult um, they are simple to understand the challenge is not in the theory it is in the implementation or the execution and that is where uh, countries really come alive in terms of the societal willingness to put the interest of the country before self, to sacrifice for the greater good, as well as how governments help our citizens to make it easy to do the right thing, such as economic rescue measures, um, and 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 really so on and so forth. Um, and I was struck that in Korea, it's so easy to get a swab, it's so easy to seek medical care, and this is really aligned to the principle I had articulated earlier, making it easy to do the right thing. So beyond learning from others and the need for global collaboration, I think a, very, a second very important point is to remember what Deng Xiaoping, the former Chinese um, uh, really leader, shared famously, where he said, we must cross the river by feeling the stones. And here, I don't need to lecture anyone that COVID-19 is novel for the whole world. We are in unprecedented territory. So we just have to move very carefully. It might be three steps forward, two steps back. That is the price to pay. And on this note, I also want to end off by talking about some of the general measures that we have always known to be important, but, but modern uh, science has found it difficult to quantify. And really, Jun has done a great job in going down to the molecular and the biological levels around the role of nutrition. So there are many measures that we can use to help COVID-19 not be as devastating as it has been as the world moves into the next phase. And on this note, I would like to open the panel. Uh, can I ask the panelists to turn their videos on, please? Thank you. Okay. 
Thank you, Nan. Thank you, everyone. And do we have Dr. Wu Fan on also? Great. All right, uh, we have many, many questions, and so and we don't have much time. So let me start with the first question. Uh, Jun, many people have asked from a nutrition point of view, um, what should they do? Should they eat green onions? Should they eat garlic? Should they not eat a uh, 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 fresh water fish? Can you share something about this? Okay, so thank you for your questions. Yeah, um, I can say just a balanced diet is very important. But uh, uh, in the restricted situations, such as caused by the COVID-19, we sometimes are not able to obtain sufficient vitamins, uh, for example, uh, because of the lack of the fish, vegetables, and fruits. So in these conditions, I recommend to use supplement to support the deficiency of the vitamin case. Yeah. But at the same time, we have to consider the characteristics of the vitamins. So for example, for water-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin B1s, so those vitamins are excluded from the bodies spontaneously. Thus, we have to probably take them every day. But in case of the oil-soluble vitamin, such as vitamin A's, there is another important uh, vitamin for our immune systems. But uh, uh, those vitamins accumulated in our bodies. So we have to be careful not to take some excessive amount of the vitamins to avoid the side effects. So that is a case of the case of the vitamin characteristics. I think another diet is also applicable same issues. Over. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. And can I move to Han? And can I ask you, um, um, what is the role of of AI in developing vaccines faster. As you pointed out in your earlier presentation that the world is in a race. We've had an incredible number of really candidate vaccines. Could you share a little of how the technologies around data science have helped to make this faster and what's the outlook moving forward? Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Lin, for the question. Uh, it's a tricky question, <laughs> uh, I have to say. Um, when you look at nowadays, uh, the knowledge we have accrued over time, right, since uh, last December, there is now a, a growing uh, amount of corona coronavirus-related um, data sets, uh, as well as published um, publications, uh, papers here and there. So that must be leveraged with uh, AI, I think, um, to combat and fight COVID-19 um, for vaccine development. I believe that AI can help. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, although I'm not an expert on AI, I have to say, uh, leveraging the, um, the power of AI. Um, for instance, trillions of compounds can be screened um, uh, in a remarkably uh, short time frame, um, allowing for rapid identification of uh, vaccine candidates, for instance. Um, I think I have seen a few papers, and again, I'm not an expert, to say that if AI can help, and I think there are companies uh, looking into uh, different data sets, uh, Google DeepMind, I've seen something lately. Uh, they were able to use AI algorithm uh, to predict the structure of uh, the protein base um, uh, on, it, on its genetic code, um, this kind of thing. So I believe that AI can contribute to that and then help you somehow um, uh, design uh, the right vaccine platform. Uh, and I think um, looking at you know, some uh, vaccine companies or platform, they had constructed very quickly uh, the protein, right? Uh, that is implemented in the platform. And then to go into clinic uh, quite rapidly, I'm thinking of Moderna, for instance. So I think AI has contributed to uh, establish you know, the profile of your antigen or the proteins, and then help you develop right away and leveraging your platform that is already available for that. So that's where, AI can play a role, and again, I'm not an expert, but um, that's a new area, I think, of nowadays. Yeah, but can I turn to June and talk a little about the use of AI and really data science? You have shown some very nice slides about the IT system that uh, the you use to look at bacterial strains, and are there any uh, gut microbiome profiles that protect against COVID-19, or as you 
alluded to earlier seem to make the immune response more really successful? Uh, okay, thank you, Jerry. Me? Uh, actually, we are now working on, but uh, we still don't know why the, so the patient infected with COVID-19 is so small in Japan. Maybe some kind of the uh, commensal bacteria may enhance the, uh, our immune systems. But uh, uh, experimentally, uh, we also identified uh, some commensal bacteria reducing the IgA antibody productions. So probably some, uh, we think always that gut commensal bacteria enhance immune responses. But some kind of the commensal bacteria may reduce or decrease the immune activities. But we are still working on going, so I hope that we can show our results in your future. Thank you. Uh -huh. And I think many of these efforts, they will converge. We want a very good vaccine, but in the best prepared host. And the best prepared host is not just about general health, but also the state of the microbiome and the state of the micronutrients. So as all yeah. of you work, I think that the, it is important that all these findings, they then aggregate together so that we as the world become collectively smarter. Uh, and I, and I do want to ask um, both Anne as well as June um, a question around uh, really mortality. And I do recall back in SARS, there was a comment around how kimchi protected Korea from, from the SARS. And it's striking that in all our countries, Singapore, China, Korea, as well as Japan, that the overall mortality has been very, very low. Um, and I will start with really Singapore. Uh, part of the reason is that the vast majority of the of the infected cases here in Singapore are in the migrant worker population, and this population tends to be much younger and generally healthy. And in fact, um, many of the workers who have been diagnosed to be positive, they were picked up on essentially screening because they did not have any symptoms. Um, but even amongst the Singapore population, we have been very, very fortunate. Um, but when but when journalists or when uh, um, interviewers ask us what is the secret, I'm afraid we don't have any secret other than that we learn from China, we learn from many other countries to, to, to prepare early. So Singapore's health system was not overwhelmed and we were able to devote a lot of resources to the patients who were unfortunate enough to require ventilation support as well as critical. So, uh, but we, don't have any special foods. There's no, uh, no one who has uh, got any herbs or garlic or anything like that. But maybe Ann and Jun, do you have any comments about the secret of Korea or Japan's success in the very low mortalities? Uh, who would like to start? Uh, Jun, please. Professor Jun? I don't know if Professor okay. Jun wants to start. Uh, yes, please, Jun. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, actually, the, I don't have any good answer yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think that one each, several possibilities can be considered. So one is the genetic background. Maybe the um, recept coronavirus receptors, AC2, maybe the expression levels may differ in the Asian countries and the other uh, peoples in the other uh, countries. But also, uh, we are not hesitated to take a mask in Japan, especially. Mm -hmm. So all uh, that season is uh, same season as the influenza virus, as well as a pollen allergy. So we usually take the mask without any COVID-19 crisis. Mm -hmm. So that is a one uh, probable explanations, not to do excessive number of the patient in Japan. So that is a still possibility, but that is my idea. Okay, thank you. And and. And what about Korea? What is the secret of Korea's success? And then we'll go to Dr. Wu Fan after that. Well, I don't know what is, uh, I mean, um, because I have heard as you you have as well for the kimchi, right? Uh, it has been something mentioned for MERS uh, outbreak. I don't know whether it has a role. Um, but I think it's a very difficult question. Um, looking at uh, COVID-19, and we do have already predictable factors, right? We know that age and presence of comorbidities uh, increase the case fatality rate. We know it's above 20% in uh, 80 years uh, of age uh, population or elderly population. Uh, 
but why we have such a variety or, or heterogeneity uh, across the different countries, different regions, when you look at the case fatality rate? To me, it could be a combination of different things, um, as always. Uh, I don't have a single um, you know, answer to say that thanks to this uh, or that. But to me, um, you know, the way the different reports um, are coming up, the number of deaths uh, and or the confirmed cases between countries, I think there's also um, heterogeneity in terms of case definition, how you test and the capacity of testing samples. Uh, that's something very important in terms of reporting methodology or counting methodology. Uh, has a role in the way we look at the, the numbers. I don't know, I know the healthcare uh, system, I think, uh, has also a critical role here, uh, how to manage you know, uh, the patients at the early stage or late stage, um, how people commute to the healthcare system. Also, I think uh, the early uh, case management uh, has uh, a role as well. Um, I don't know whether socioeconomic factors could play a role, um, but to have the explanation um, to that you know, case fatality rate that uh, differs from one country to another, it's very difficult to, to tease out um, uh, the answer. But, you know, I believe we need a large scale uh, assessment of the proportion of the population infected um, by the virus to provide more accurate, I would say, data to better understand and better estimate the case fatality rates. So there's still a lot of unknown, as we know, um, and then there's a lot of things around the individual freedom versus collectiv collectivistic uh, benefits. So all in all, there are multiple reasons that could extend. We have a different uh, case fatality rate uh, observed in different countries. And if I turn to Dr. Wu Fan, uh, you had you had mentioned that that other than Hubei, um, most of China had very low uh, really mortality rates uh, below one below one one percent. Uh, could you share a little more with the benefit now of hindsight? Um, what what went wrong in Hubei, um, and what were the things beyond the sheer number of uh, of of uh, well cases? Because the rest of the rest of China learned very quickly and improved very much, so that there is a stark difference in terms of the mortality rates between Hubei and the rest of China. Over to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, many person uh, noticed that the in in Wuhan and the other the at the other of the the rest of the China is totally different. I think it's mainly because of Wuhan is the city who uh, it, it, where they found the first cases, uh, or or they. Uh, now we, we don't know whether they are really uh, the first cases, but anyway, they reported. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yep. This is the important. But when they reported, they reported it as a, as a, a re-emerging infectious disease, and it didn't appear, and we don't know about the uh, the, the the virus at all. So at the very beginning, people don't know the disease itself, how they happened, where they come from, how do, how the virus tra uh, 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 transmission, and uh, uh, we need to take what kind of uh, uh, protection, PPE, um, how we do this, and uh, what kind of a process of the disease itself. So all these, currently we know all these, but at that moment, no one knows about that. So that means the doctor facing an unknown, totally new disease, they need some time to uh, learn about it, to know yeah. about it. But unfortunately, this virus has a highly trans capacity to transmission. So at that duration, I don't think it's a pretty long time. It's actually the short time. I only have uh, uh, 10 days about. They suddenly found it has a highly transmission. And, uh, but unfortunately, the doctor got infection. So once the doctor got infection, and already that uh, the community have the community transmission because you, 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 you cannot stop the first cases that have been infected the, uh, to the others, infected transmitted to the others. So this is, is totally different. So I think sometimes I think even in, in Shanghai, we think that we have a very good uh, surveillance system that we can only find out the cases, but uh, sometimes I always ask myself if these the first cases happen in Shanghai. Yes, 
we can find them earlier. But could we stop the transmission in the hospital? Maybe not. So yes. that that this we already see in the other country everywhere. So I think this is the the, the difference. That that means in Wuhan, once you find it, and the severe cases happened, the fatal cases happened, that we suddenly uh, I uh, or that we suddenly notice that this is very important. They have highly transmission, but the others is different. We know this quickly. We at that moment, China don't know uh, the what kind of uh, how the uh, capacity the virus is, but we know it's highly transmission. So, for stop the transmission for any infectious disease, we have the very typical uh, principles, three principles: protect the, uh, isolate the the, the infection infection person, and also do the stop the transmission, and then and and then also protect the the population. So for these, but all these measures could be different. Yes. So that we. That is the. I think this is very different. So for Shanghai and the other of the the rest of the China, um, what do we do? We very carefully try to find out old population movement at that moment. It's Chinese New Year. Have a lot of uh, the uh, passengers from Wuhan, from Hubei, and we try to find them, check with them, and do a lot of measures to uh, some certain person to isolation with them and ask them to report their symptom what they have so measuring the temperature body temperature every day so we we try to find them earlier and yeah. diagnose them earlier then yeah. we can do uh, uh, contact tracing identify the contact person close contact person and also to ident uh, uh, isolation for these uh, close contact person. That is yes. very, very important because early, that we yeah. stop the transmission, early transmission. We didn't find, we didn't happen the, the, uh, the community transmission in Shanghai until now. So yes. yeah. I think if you ask me still, I, I will repeat that. Testing, okay. yes. uh, isolation, uh, uh, testing, uh, tracing, isolating. This is yes. very, very important. Okay, okay we, have, we have run out of time, so I want to ask one last question. Can I just have a one sentence answer from each of you? And let's start with Anne. Uh, question, do you think the worst is over? Yes or no and why? Just, and just one sentence. Over to you, Anne. The worst is over. Um, I would say uh, we need to remain vigilant. Okay, so Eternal vigilance, as they say, is the price of peace. June, what about you? Is the worst over? Yes, I agree with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, that's a very optimistic note. And Dr. Wufan, the last word to you. Do you think the worst is, is over? Yes, but I still have a long way to get a success. All right, thank you very much. And on this note, I'd like to thank all of you for a wonderful for wonderful presentations and a very interesting dialogue. And can I hand the time back to Mrs. Young? Over to you. Thank you, um, Jeremy and uh, Dr. Fan, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wu, uh, Dr. Kunisawa, as well as Anne. Thank you for your time in joining us. Now, I'm going to ask Jeff, um, before I met him, Jeff, our uh, president, to close the, uh, the, uh, um, to close the, um, the webinar as well as um, to just say a few words. And thank you again. And we'll be uh, looking at maybe uh, producing a, a, a report on this. And the webinar will be uh, recorded and uh, also be uh, available for download later on. Jeff, over to you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Buni. Thank you to our fantastic uh, speakers and uh, moderator. This was, uh, I think, a really important event. Um, so often these topics are dealt with in isolation, but I think this was a real opportunity to see how these all these issues tie together from detection, from public health measures, from vaccine development and, and nutrition and immunity. 
um, it's a broad continuum. So we thought it was good to bring all this together. And again, we'd like to thank uh, Professor uh, all the experts, Professor uh, Ufan, Professor An Wartel, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Jun Kunisawa, and Dr. Jeremy Lim for moderating. Um, I do want to say that we are going to have a follow-up uh, to this uh, the, to this uh, series, uh, probably in August to further develop some of these topics and see what next steps can be taken and see what progress has been made. Um, I would remind you, uh, we have just had um, recently uh, in the last month, a webinar on food system resilience in the wake of COVID-19. Um, and that's being, now that video is available, you can find it on our website. Um, uh, we are going to have a publication uh, been written up for, for submission uh, to, to a major journal. Uh, so we'll uh, you'll get some more information about that in the not too distant future. Um, I would uh, like to say you can find more information about all the ELC activities in all the various topics, many issues dealing with food safety and nutrition, um, are, uh, which you can find videos uh, of other talks, and we've had some other webinars on nutrition and immunity, so you can find those on our website. We'd like to thank you very much for attending us. Hope you enjoyed. We look forward to, uh, to the further dealing with the questions and further engagement on these important scientific topics. Thank you all very much.